Good afternoon, folks. My name is Dr. Charles Snodgrass, and this is English 200, World Literature One, uh, Grambling State University, Fall 2021. And this will be the first video lecture of 10 for this course. And these video lectures are for both CRN 13197 and CR uh, in 13260. We're running these courses simultaneously the same. Um, as you can see in the syllabus that is already in Canvas, um, there is no textbook purchase required because I have already provided the links to the readings for you. So if you click either one of these links here, the uh, the text link, or in this case, the master link. Uh, I'll go ahead and click that. What you will see is the entire set of slides and folders for this course. Um, this is inside of Google Drive. For those of you unfamiliar with a Google Drive, there is a little toggle switch over here. And um, that allows you to view it currently like in a list view, like you would in a folder on a computer or a grid view like this. So um, inside of this classroom, World Literature One, as you see, um, <clears throat> I have called or put together uh, all of the texts, like in this folder, here are all of the texts. These are scanned text from the oral literature anthology by Norton, uh, the third edition, not the fourth edition. Uh, I specifically asked for the third edition, but the bookstore said they could only sell the newer fourth edition. I'll let you make of that what you may. Um, inside of this, uh, you have folders that are slides, uh, which I will be using a lot to discuss these uh, text to kind of contextualize them. So again, if you click on this button up here, you'll see the slides in the kind of um, grid format as opposed to list format. Uh, again, this is all available to you just by clicking on that master link in the um, here on the syllabus, right? So on this page one of the syllabus, you have a kind of simplified version of the course schedule. Um, there are 14 modules consisting of reading quizzes, of uh, an essay, an exam, more reading quizzes, another essay, and another exam. And that's it, folks. There is no percentage or evaluation for attendance because your attendance will be key to your submission here of your quizzes and uh, essays and exams. So please read this technological requirements section um, that explains to you, you know, the kind of nuts and bolts of how to get help and, you know, what you need in terms of, uh, you know, equipment. Here are my course policies are pretty straightforward. Uh, the no late work being accepted simply means that if you miss a deadline in Canvas that once it's closed, it's closed. So what I've done in this section of course assignments is kind of write in detail uh, what each of these types of assignments are and how to uh, approach and study for them. <clears throat> Notice that for the reading quizzes and for both the exams, exam one and two, there are unlimited attempts. So if you get one or more questions wrong, when you take a quiz, you can go right back in and um, you know, select the correct answers again to, in order to get the highest score. Um, I've done this so that you will hopefully be reinforced with the right and correct answers, uh, not to mention to help your grade. Uh, but once the you know, deadline occurs, so like up here again, um, this coming Monday, 
August 23rd at midnight. Um, if you haven't taken the quiz or you still have questions that are wrong, um, that's how your grade will stand. Um, and, you know, if you bomb one or two quizzes, hopefully not because you have unlimited attempts, uh, that won't torpedo your overall grade. But if you consistently do poorly, um, that will quickly add up, right? Um, so like I say here, you know, just plan ahead in order to do well. Don't wait till the last hour, if you will, to submit an exam or quiz. Um, for office hours, um, in keeping with the guidelines for safe and uh, teaching and learning environment put out by the provost's office, uh, I'll be conducting office hours virtually on Zoom. So if you need to meet with me virtually, please, you know, just in Canvas inbox me and we can set up a time, uh, preferably between these times. If not, we can find a mutually agreeable time. And I'll send you a Zoom meeting ID and time and we'll, you know, have our little one-on-one, -on -one, if you will. So um, again, here's the course schedule that mirrors the one in Canvas in terms of your modules. Uh, and today we're going to be discussing this text here, the first portion of the Hebrew Bible, which you know, Christians call the Old Testament. Uh, and I'm currently making this video for, for that. And again, don't forget your first quiz for this will be this coming Monday, August 23rd. Okay, well, here is the text and uh, if, again, on the syllabus, you were to, uh, let me go back to the syllabus, if you were to just, you know, inside Canvas, uh, inside module one in this case, if you were to click this link, it takes you right to the text. And all of these are scanned PDF files that ideally you, you, you know, would download and print out and read on your own, or you can just save them to your computer. Uh, so again, there is no textbook to buy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some different sources and resources to explain this text. I'm clearly obviously going to be using the text itself, which uh, was scanned from, you can see it's, it's a bit shoddy here in places. It's scanned from an actual, uh, you know, three volume Norton anthology. Uh, so when it's scanned on a photocopier, you can see some of the, <clears throat> the text through the pages because those pages are so thin. Anyhow, uh, I'll be using the text itself. I'll be using uh, some uh, of my own notes, if you will, um, that uh, you know will become part of this video lecture. And I will be using these slides uh, that are in that folder, the Hebrew Bible. And I may even uh, use the internet to go off and explain uh, something that comes up in, in the discussion, if you will. So um, let me uh, first start with some of the slides. And again, these are in your, um, you know, click the master link and then look at the, in this case, the Hebrew viral slides. Um, I find it easier to work from um, the slides on my computer rather than from, uh, what do you call it, uh, in the folder because uh, they're, they're a bit difficult to manage uh, on the Google Drive interface. So I have them all here on my, my laptop, which you can too, if you want, you're, you're welcome to download any or all of these things. So what you see here is um, one of several chronologies that appear in the back of the Norton three volume world literature anthology. Um, and the black here, anything that's in black represents a text, you know, something that's written. 
and then something in gray represents something that is a historical contextual moment like here uh, circa which is an abbreviation for the latin word approximately or about uh, 3000 bce uh, you have sumerian cuneiform writing and this will become important to learn and think about when we discuss Gilg gilgamesh uh, and uh, i think it's a uh, quiz number three or the module number three so keep in mind that um i should maybe switch my notes here that when we're talking about ancient writing um, we are talking here about the BCE era or before the common era. Now, it used to be about maybe 30, 40 years ago that we simply use BC. Um, but as scholars and archaeologists and anthropologists began to really kind of piece together what we call the archaeological record of human society and civilization uh, together with you know its writings we realize that basing um, our dating system if you will on the year zero the year that christ is born um, is a bit inaccurate so they have gone to a, a new system if you will called the bce before the common era uh, common era being what we're living in now and everything before the common era would be you know the egyptians and gilgamesh and in this case uh, the religion of origins of judaism so uh, this uh, timeline this chronology here as you can see at the bottom is in bce and remember that when you're thinking of chronological time if you start from the year zero let's say when christ is born uh, he dies at the age of 33 so the year 33 but if you start at zero and go backwards you're basically going to the left if you will whereas if you go to the right you're going higher in numbers and reaching eventually today 2021 um, so this is uh, helpful to think about in terms of uh, text because um, what we're looking at, well, here, this will come in play uh, again in a couple of weeks, like here, 1200 around or circa 1200 BCE, you have the final or definitive version of Gilgamesh. But roughly at the same time, Moses is leading the Jews uh, in Exodus, right? So what I'm gonna point out hopefully with uh, this information is that Gilgamesh as a text is much older, almost easily a thousand years older than the first origins, if you will, of what we know as the Hebrew Bible. So here around 1000 BCE, right? parts of the Hebrew Bible, that is the Old Testament, are being put together. And this comes into play when we start thinking about eventually in the next quiz and, and reading uh, the story of Noah and the flood, where you have a story that is almost identical. There are some significant changes, but, uh, but in general, almost identical from a story or episode that occurs in the Epic of Gilgamesh that is, again, uh, more than or easily a thousand years older than the Bible itself. So um, these slides are in your um, Hebrew Bible slide folder. You can check them out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the area we're focusing on with the Hebrew Bible, of course, is what we know as present day Middle East. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of <laughs> our nation right, has a lot of familiarity with this area because, of course, um, you know, not only is Jerusalem the, you know, capital of Israel, present day Israel, but 
Um, it's where Christ was crucified. Uh, it's a city that is claimed as the Holy Land by three religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, but it's also, of course, the general region in which for now that, you know, since roughly 2001, uh, really specifically 2003, when we had boots on the ground, that uh, we began to, you know, uh, go into first Kuwait, then Iraq, and then eventually Afghanistan off, off of the map here, right? And of course, we're still there <laughs> with troops in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So um, some of the oldest manuscripts of the Bible or the Hebrew Bible, as it's properly called, uh, are from these Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea is a, a kind of landlocked, what we would think of as large lake, like think of one of the great lakes or, or like our Salt Lake City in uh, Utah. Uh, and around that lake are these caves, but in these caves were found uh, in the 20th century, last century, these manuscripts of what are in fact the earliest versions, handwritten versions of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, now, I know you all can't read this, neither can I, because it's written in what we call ancient Hebrew, not, uh, you know, current Hebrew, which they do speak in currently in, uh, in Israel, but ancient Hebrew. So there's a bit of a difference. Um, now, the thing about Hebrew, like Arabic, uh, are all what we call Semitic languages, Semitic meaning uh, people who are originally nomadic um, and therefore Arabic, right? You, you read from not left to right like we do, but from right to left. And, you know, like here's the end of a sentence, right? And then you go on to a new paragraph as it were. And so uh, in, we'll get, back to this later when we discuss Islam and the Quran, but when you're reading uh, something like this, in case, you know, the Torah, as we'll talk about in a moment, or uh, the Quran, you turn the, you start from what we would consider the back of the book, and you work your way to the left, what we think of as the front of the book. Um, so speaking of, you know, uh, these books, uh, those are not horns, by the way, but they're supposed to represent the divinity of God, because, of course, this is Moses uh, holding, you know, the Ten Commandments, um, bringing down from Mount Sinai to the people. Um, so let me, uh, speaking of Moses right here, right? This is in the introductory section of, of the reading. It says, uh, traditionally, Moses is thought to have been the author of the first five books of the Bible, and also, according to some traditions, the book of Job. But modern biblical scholars agree that these books, in their current form, must have been woven together from several different earlier sources. And we'll get back to that when uh, we discuss Gilgamesh in a couple of weeks. Um, and I should perhaps back up and point out that um, the reason why I'm beginning this world literature class with this text is precisely this right here, uh, that, you know, you may not be Christian or have been raised Christian or Jewish for that matter, but it has become what we call Judeo-Christianity, the two together, think of the Old and the New Testament together. It has become incredibly influential in what we call Western culture and around the world. So the beginning of this introductory section says, the sacred writings of the ancient Hebrew people are arguably the world's most influential texts. They have remained the sacred text of Judaism and have inspired two of their major world religions, Christianity and Islam. And so that, that is the order in which these religions emerged. Judaism first, think of the Old Testament, Christianity, think of the New Testament, and then Islam, think of the Quran. Because these texts have been so influential in human affairs and become central to so many people's core religious beliefs, 
they are not often read in the same way as literary texts. And that's actually in this world literature class where we're doing with these sacred texts like the Hebrew Bible and the Quran. We're not reading them as divine texts like you might in a church or a mosque. We're reading them as pieces of literature written by human beings. Um, so, you know, there are things that I'll point out that are somewhat different. Uh, anyhow, going back to Moses here, he is considered to have written what we call here the first five books of the Bible, or in Hebrew, they call that the Torah. Uh, in Greek, they call that the Pentateuch. You can see here, of course, Penta, think of like Pentagon. <clears throat> um, it means five. And these first five books of the Bible, some of which many of you have probably read or know well, uh, are believed to have been written by Moses. And our reading, both this time and next time, is really only of Genesis. Um, that is really just portions of books of Genesis, not, not the entire Genesis. And speaking of which, um, the text that we're using um, in this uh, moral literature from Norton, W.W. Uh, w. Norton, the publisher in uh, New York, going down to the end of this section, uh, because they dis uh, describe here that the translation that's being used here for Genesis uh, is not the common uh, or often used in churches, King James Version or other, you know, the NIV version, uh, but it's a translation by a biblical scholar named Robert Alter. Um, Speaking of translations, uh, we'll come back to this when we get to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Luther in the second part of the, the course. But I want to point out to you this uh, nifty little site. Uh, it's a free site called the Bible Gateway. And when you go to it first, it typically defaults to right here, the NIV or New International Version, but I'm just going to scroll through here and show you alphabetically all of the, just here in English, right, because there are other languages included here, all of the different versions or translations of the Bible. And, it, you know, there's the King James Version, there's the Authorized King James Version, right? Um, and it kind of may want you to you know, make you scratch your head and wonder why are all of these different versions in English alone available? You know, what, what's wrong with one version? Uh, again, that's something we will discuss later, but uh, it's a nifty little site because if you were wanting to find, uh, you know, a word or a name very quickly, you can just uh, say, you know, type in Moses, uh, and it will render up very quickly, in this case, you know, uh, 803 <laughs> results, right? But it will break them down by uh, book and then chapter in the book. Um, so, you know, if you wanna check that out later, feel free, uh, just a resource you can use on your own or, or in conjunction with this course. So um, let me get back to these slides here. Um, there's Moses again, and uh, here is an actual version of the word, so to speak, of, of the first five books of the Bible known in Jewish religion, Judaism, as the Torah. And you can see here that it's you know, written uh, in ancient uh, Hebrew, and uh, it's on a scroll and there's a pointer here because this object, if you will, or cultural artifact of the Torah, the scroll um, is considered divine according to Jews. And so it would be disrespectful to physically touch it as you're reading along. So they use a pointer to keep track of where they are reading. Um, and you can see here these Orthodox uh, Hasidic Jews, if you will, uh, they're out next to what is called the 
Western Wall, the, the Holy Wall uh, of King Solomon's Temple that is in Jerusalem. And they are performing their traditional prayer, reading the Torah out loud, or what we would say reading the Old Testament out loud, but of course in ancient Hebrew. Um, and they have these little, as you can see, what look like boxes on their heads, right? And it's called a Teflon. And inside the Teflon is a little rolled up piece of scripture of the Torah. And it's meant to symbolically, uh, they typically do not wear uh, all of this 100% of the time, but they do dress in the uh, Orthodox Jews dress in the black hat and black clothes like this, males do. Uh, they don't wear the Teflon typically, but when they're praying, but it's as a symbolic reminder to keep God foremost in your mind. Um, here's another example, they're doing the same thing. Um, and uh, you can see this, you know, they not only have beards, but in the back here, uh, they have these long kind of locks on the side. Um, and that is because one of the dictums, if you will, in the Old Testament in Leviticus is not to cut your hair. So that's an outward showing that they're following the faith closely. So there's the pointer of reading the Torah. In the Jewish faith, in Judaism, when you turn 13 and you're a boy, you take what is called a bar mitzvah. Uh, bar mitzvah is a basic uh, coming of age ceremony in the Jewish faith. And you study uh, ancient Hebrew in uh, Hebrew school for many months uh, to become fairly fluent in it so that you stand in front of the congregation and you literally kind of chant or sing a portion of the Torah. Uh, and that's part of the ceremony. Uh, and he's, you can see here, wearing what's called a yarmulke as a sign of respect in not a church, but either they call it a temple or a synagogue. And if you're a girl, you perform the same ritual, but it's called a bat mitzvah. So uh, part of this reading uh, discusses a very familiar story, if you will, called the creation story. And uh, some might call it creation myth. There are lots of religions. In fact, virtually all religions have their own kind of creation story or myth. And this particular image is fairly famous. It is the center panel of a fresco painted on the wall of the Sistine Chapel. Not the number 16, but Sistine, S-I-S, T-I-N-E. And there's right here in the center again, there's that famous plate. But of course, what this is, is Michelangelo's famous masterpiece, this fresco on the ceiling. Uh, and this of course is the most central and important one because it's God just about to, not quite, just about to animate uh, man or in this case, Adam. Uh, Michelangelo was uh, almost thrown in jail because of this, because he was actually depicting frontal nudity inside a church, no less. Uh, the Sistine Chapel itself is inside the grounds of the Vatican. The Vatican, of course, remains the um, epicenter of the Catholic religion, and uh, the Vatican, of course, is in Rome. So uh, we'll talk about in a moment here, Adam and Eve and that creation story. The setting of this comes out of what we call either Mesopotamia here, or it's also known as the Fertile Crescent. So this sort of pink or darker shaded area formed like, you know, kind of semicircle or crescent um, is where we have you know, the kind of early religions uh, of culture and their early ones as well in India and China, of course. Um, but of course we know about the Egyptians and the Nile River, and this is technically on the African continent, right? The Red Sea here uh, splits the Asian and 
African continents. But um, here in what is present day, I'll just go to the next slide here, present day Iraq, okay, is where you have the Tigris and Euphrates River. And we're gonna learn that um, Uruk was the sort of home base of the King Gilgamesh, who was in fact a real king. And Ur was the origin of the biblical Abraham. And he eventually wanders Abraham uh, through what is present day Iraq and then over here to what is present day Israel, uh, back then known as Canaan or the Holy Land. Um, so this is again, important region area for us to learn about because you know our cultural roots are tied to this with the religion. Uh, this is one of many images or slides that are in the actual Norton anthology. Uh, but again, you have it in the slide section. And this image appears in the introductory section of today's reading. And I wanna point it out for, or highlight it for two reasons. Um, on the one hand, uh, again, you see here this dotted line says Abraham's wanderings, okay? It starts here in Ur, kind of goes along the Euphrates River and then through present day Syria and then down through Damascus and then into again, present day Israel. Uh, but then this inside here, this, then it was known as Canaan, okay? And that's typically what the Israelites in, in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, they call this land, they call it the land of Canaan. Uh, so if you see the land of Canaan or someone or something refer to the land of Canaan, they're talking about what eventually becomes present day Israel. Uh, it's variously known in the Bible. If I go back to my notes here, uh, as either Canaan, the Holy Land, the Promised Land, or the land of milk and honey. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's the Promised Land because God promises this land to his people, to the Israelites. Um, and by the way, there again is the Dead Sea. Uh, it's this landlocked lake in present day Israel. Uh, here, north of that, you know, we have the River Jordan, right? Many gospel songs refer to the River Jordan. But you have the Sea of Galilee, which of course famously uh, Christ walks upon when he walks on water. The other thing about this uh, map that's kind of interesting is that um, it shows here, you know, as it says, the wanderings in the wilderness of the Israelites under Moses, right? So remember that as the story goes, the Israelites are captured by the Pharaoh in Egypt over here, which is present day Cairo. And then of course they eventually escape through Moses's and his brother's help. Uh, and Moses parts the Red Sea down here, but they don't quite know where they are. And According to the story, it takes them, you know, 40 years to get back there, though Moses is unable to make the journey to the Holy Land, ironically. So getting back to Adam and Eve, uh, what we're going to have here in uh, chapter three of Genesis is a story many of you are familiar with. I would dare say most <laughs> uh, people in Western culture are familiar with because it's so, you know, part of our uh, heritage, if you will. It's a story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And this Renaissance era painting kind of depicts all of the points. So God puts, you know, figuratively, God puts Adam and Eve in the garden and tells them that they can do anything, go anywhere, except there is one tree that they cannot eat from. And it's the tree, the full name of which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, that part at the end uh, of good and evil is important to remember. So 
we'll learn, right, that the serpent makes its way into the garden, offers it to Eve, Eve offers it to Adam. Uh, they become ashamed of their nakedness and they hide from God. You know, God is looking for them, but of course God knows where they are. And then he casts them out of the garden for disobeying him. Um, here is the angel Gabriel, or excuse me, the angel Michael. Uh, he's depicted here with a sword, uh, sometimes a sword of lightning or fire, but he's in effect God's uh, strong arm, if you will, as opposed to the messenger angel Gabriel, who's the one who appears to Mary and to Muhammad and so on. Um, so this kind of idyllic scene, the Garden of Eden is uh, you know, something we're familiar with. And um, there are many depictions of this, you know, moment where Eve eats the fruit. Uh, sometimes we think of it an, of an apple, but it's probably not an apple. It's probably a persimmon to be more accurate in terms of geolocation. Uh, this is a famous painting by William Blake, uh, so much so that people have gotten it as a tattoo. Um, and then, you know, the serpent who comes in different form, the serpent who really, of course, is in serpent form, you know, formerly Lucifer, Lucifer this, you know, bright star that, uh, you know, most beautiful angel in heaven who's cast out of uh, heaven into hell or originally pandemonium, uh, but then makes his way into the garden in serpent form, right? So let's look at the text. Um, and here, right, this is the creation to the murder of Abel. Uh, most of the books, they, they've excerpted some out of it. Um, you know, it's a familiar story. Again, I'm not going to read all of this to you. You can read it, right? It's, you know, on the first day, God creates this, on the second day, and so on. Uh, one thing I want to point out, though, is like when it says here at the end of uh, book one, and it was evening and it was morning, the sixth day, right? Um, when it says day here, right, um, you're totally allowed to read it and think of it as a day. And if you do, what you're doing is going back to my notes here, um, you are reading the Bible literally or word for word. However, if you think of day as anything longer than, you know, sunrise and sunset, uh, 24 hour revolution uh, by our standards, if you think of it as, you know, an indeterminate amount of years, a thousand, a million years or whatever, then you're reading the text figuratively, which you're also allowed to do. The problem for interpretation of sacred texts, whether it's in this case, the Hebrew Bible or you know, later the New Testament or the Quran or uh, the you know, Hindu Sanskrit uh, Vedas or, or whatever sacred text. If you switch between these two modes, if you go from literal and figurative and back and forth, whenever it suits your needs, that's when we get into some real problems. Um, you know, if you go back to that Bible gateway and you look at the laws given by Moses, uh, of which there are many, uh, one example is that um, it says very clearly that if, well, let me just, uh, I don't want you to think I'm making this stuff up. Um, go into the Bible gateway, that if people commit adultery, then they should be stoned to death, right? Um, so this is Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. If you wanted to switch that to the King James Version, which some of you are familiar with, you can just switch it to the KJB here. 
right? And it's the same idea, just in kind of Renaissance diction. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Now, if we were reading the Bible literally, then that's what we should do when people commit adultery. Uh, and adultery by their standards, of course, means not just sex while you're married with someone other than your spouse, but sex out of wedlock before you're married. But we don't do that. That is to say, uh, you know, we would have a lot of dead people if uh, that were the case. So we are, in this case, you know, Americans and most people are reading that law in Leviticus figuratively, not literally. Um, all right, let me go back to the text here. And so there's uh, this reference to Adam uh, being uh, like hummus, if you will, right? Like uh, from the soil. It's the moment, you know, when God creates him, that kind of depiction that Michelangelo showed there. Um, and you have this footnote that uh, is a bit of a pun on Adam, right? That he's like uh, human, but, you know, in the Jewish uh, or Hebrew, it means hummus or soil, right? So, um, you know, we think of Adam as, you know, a male's name, but uh, as we see here, Adama, right? The root of the, the word means uh, from the soil, you know, because that's where God created us from, according to the tradition. In excuse me, in here, chapter one, in the, the discussion of the creation, if you will, there's very specific information about the geography, if you will, of Eden. It says here, now river runs out of Eden to water the garden and from there splits off into four streams or tributaries. The name of the first is Pishon, the one that winds through the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is goodly. Bedelium is there and Lapis Lazuli. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the one that winds through all the land of Cush, Cush being what we would think of as present day uh, Pakistan and India. And the name of the third river is Tigris, the one that goes to the east of Asher. And the fourth river is Euphrates. So these two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, that are specifically mentioned in the Bible in Genesis about Eden, reminds us going back to these, uh, sorry, going back to these maps here, right? That uh, it is a very uh, real place or was believed to be a real place. So there's the Tigris River and the Euphrates River on this map and you know present day map there's the tigris and euphrates and present day iraq so you know the other four rivers aren't mentioned here but we can generally say that somewhere around here what is present day iraq what was formerly in the bible known as babylonia uh, was originally the garden of eden so um returning to the text here This is um, where we learn that they are first, Adam and Eve, uh, naked, but they were not ashamed. Uh, lots of depictions, Renaissance and older paintings and whatnot show a fig leaf, if you will, covering their genitals, but um, that was not how they would have you know, been. I mean, you know, we are all born uh, completely nude, right? That's how we come into the world. But they were also not ashamed of being nude. It's when in the next book here, book three, when the serpent comes, that they then learn, if you will, from the you know tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that nakedness seems to be an evil thing, uh, which is a, a common kind of issue, a thread, you might say, that runs throughout a lot of uh, not just biblical texts, but but many different sacred texts that somehow nudity is 
is a bad thing. We need to be ashamed of it. Uh, here at the beginning of uh, book three, it says, now the serpent was the most cunning of all the beasts of the field that Lord God had made. Uh, again, if you wanted to see that uh, in the King James Version, uh, you would just go to Genesis 3, right? So there it is. Let me just increase the size a bit. Now the serpent was more subtle, our translation says cunning, uh, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden, right? He's the serpent questioning Eve. A question I kind of want to put to you if you haven't thought about it is, um, why does God let the serpent into the Garden of Eden? Now, according to Christian doctrine and theology, right? Um, the Judeo-Christian God, so Judeo meaning from the Old Testament, Judaism and a Christian meaning, of course, the <clears throat> New Testament of you know, Christ, that together we call that culturally Judeo-Christian. But, but this Judeo-Christian God is three things. He's omniscient, that is all knowing. Uh, the root of this word, think of science here, right? It means knowledge. Uh, he knows everything. So uh, this is the fancy scholarly abbreviation, confer, meaning compare. Um, a, a note to remind you to think of predestination so that God, if he knows everything or he's omniscient, then that means he already knows what's going to happen, that things are predestined to occur. Uh, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. So, you know, Adam and Eve can't really hide because he's everywhere. And of course he's omnipotent, he's all powerful. Um, so the question becomes, if God is all knowing, he's omniscient, then why does he allow <laughs> this to occur? Because he knows what's going to happen already. He knows what, what's going to inevitably result that the humans are going to fail the test, but he allows the test anyway. Uh, some ministers or theologians, they might argue that it's you know, uh, a moment where God is allowing free will, so to speak, of humans to be tested, whether or not they'll actually choose right from wrong. Uh, in this case, of course, you know, human beings are sinners, they choose wrongly. Uh, but yeah, just uh, something for you to think about why God has allowed the serpent in the garden. And once the serpent is in, uh, here he is again questioning Eve. He says, uh, uh, you shall not be doomed to die for God knows that only the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will become as gods knowing good and evil. Um, I should maybe back up here and point out that uh, the angel of light, Lucifer, was God's most glorious angel in heaven. So the backstory goes, if you read Milton's Paradise Lost, um, and what caused the war in heaven and Lucifer and his followers to be thrown out by the son of God, sitting on God's right-hand side, um, is that Lucifer became proud. Uh, you might think of, therefore, the original sin not being here, the eating of the apple, but the original sin being uh, hubris or pride of Lucifer, thinking that he too could know what God knows, which is the knowledge of good and evil, or the knowledge of life and death, if you will, uh, which of course he never learned, but he convinced his minions and followers uh, to fight for his cause before they were thrown down into pandemonium. So he's still up to his tricks, Lucifer, in this case, the form of a serpent. Um, and she, you know, we know the story goes, she does become beguiled or seduced by his rhetoric, his language, and she eats of it and gives it to her man, right? Meaning Adam. And then the eyes of the two were open and they knew they were naked. So this is a moment of recognition that somehow nakedness is something to be ashamed of because before they didn't have that knowledge. And it's sort of true if you think of, you know, little babies, if you've been around them, um, 
they're entirely happy to run around the house nude, even outside, right? Uh, it's not until we teach them over and over again that no, no, you you must you know cover yourself, uh, be ashamed of nudity. Um, that's what we've learned to do as a society, human civilization. Um, it says down here, and the woman said, it's her defense to God, the serpent beguiled me and I ate, right? I remember God already knows that the serpent is going to beguile her, but he allows it to happen anyway. Then right away, God says to the serpent here, right, to Lucifer in serpent form, uh, that he's going to curse him. And this is the first of three curses that occurs. It's first the serpent, then Eve, and then Adam. And he says to the serpent, curse be you of all cattle and all beasts of the field. On your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Enmity or hatred will I set between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He, that is, the offspring of Eve, right? You know, human beings will boot or kick your head and you will bite his heel. All of which kind of comes true. That is, the serpent does go in its belly. Uh, I know very few women who are actually chummy and down with hanging out with serpents. Um, and we as in general, like out in the field, you know, planting or farming, we do, you know, kick and kill uh, serpents before they bite us. But I wanna point out that this is one of many examples uh, of what we might call it as an etiological narrative. Um, it's a fancy phrase, uh, but it simply means a story of origins coming from the Greek word telos. Uh, it's kind of in the root of that word. Um, so I don't know, uh, to give you another example, the, the rainbow uh, could be thought of as an etiological narrative or story. Um, when we'll talk about uh, Noah next time, uh, you know, a little child looks up to the sky and asks mommy or daddy, you know, what's, what's that, what's a rainbow? And a common response is, well, you know, the Bible tells us that that's God's way of showing us that he will never flood the world again, like he did uh, in the deluge uh, when Noah was and his family were saved. Another response to that may, might be the sort of, you know, factual or scientific version, which is, well, it's the not reflection of light, but it's the refraction or breaking of light into its constituent colors, uh, like you would see in a prism that breaks up light and from, you know, red to blue. Um, so in the etiological narrative is what we have right here with this curse. And to the woman, he says, and ladies, uh, listen up. God says to the woman, he said, I will terribly sharpen your birth pangs and in pain shall you bear children. And for your man shall be your longing and he shall rule over you. So this um, last part, he shall rule over you becomes one of many points in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, where <clears throat> patriarchy, that is a society governed and ruled by men, as opposed to a matriarchy, a society ruled and governed by women. It's where patriarchy uses passages like this to justify their uh, rule or empowerment over women. Um, that's why, going back to those slides that I had uh, shown you a moment ago. Uh, some people think that because God, you know, allows the serpent in and she's, you know, seduced, if you will, beguiled by the serpent, that she's given a bad rap. You know, she was framed, that she was set up. <laughs> Um, because she does take the fruit, of course, and then she gives it to her man, uh, Adam, right? But again, God already knows this to come to pass. <clears throat> he goes on to say, God says to Adam, 
because you listen to the voice of your wife, which seems to be this sort of, you know, implicit um, message, like don't listen to your wife. You know, you were older and born first, if you will, and you were the supervisor, if you will, of Eve, and therefore she should listen to you, but you not listen to her. Um, because you did this, here is your curse. Curse be the soil for your sake, with pangs shall you eat from it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistle shall it sprout for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. Shall you eat bread <clears throat> till you return to the soil from where there, excuse me, from there where you were taken. And uh, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. It's that famous kind of phrase from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And that comes to pass too, that, you know, uh, we don't have an easy life as human beings, male or female, we have to work for our food. Uh, typically, you know, in the agricultural realm of, you know, early humans of farming, which we still do, of course. Uh, and when we die, we return to the earth, you know, typically by uh, grave. So there you go. Uh, the curses. This is uh, moving on to chapter four uh, in Genesis. And this is the instance of familiar story to many of you of the first sons of Cain, excuse me, first sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Um, Cain is born first, so he's the older brother. And then along comes Abel, the younger brother. And it says here that uh, Abel, the younger, became a herder of sheep, while Cain was a tiller of the soil or a farmer. And it happened in the course of time that Cain, the older brother, brought from the fruit of the soil an offering to the Lord. And Abel, too, had brought from the choice firstlings of his flock, meaning, you know, baby lambs or, you know, uh, choice lambs. And the Lord regarded Abel, acknowledged Abel and his offering, but he did not regard or acknowledge Cain and his offering. And Cain was very incensed and his face fell. Now, one of the points the introduction to this reading in the anthology makes is that it appears at different points in the Bible, uh, specifically older, but also New, New Testament as well, that God plays favorites. And this is a moment where God is playing favorites, in this case, with Abel, as opposed to the older brother, Cain. You could argue that it's this phrase right here that Abel brought choice firstlings, like, you know, the best of his flock or lambs to God, whereas Cain may not have brought the best of his produce or grain or whatever he was offering to God. Uh, that's one way to possibly justify why God favors Abel and not Cain. But, you know, as the story goes, right, uh, the older brother takes his younger brother out into the field and, of course, kills him, right? Um, and then God famously asks, you know, where is your brother, you know? Uh, and he says, you know, right here, am I my brother's keeper, uh, right? And this is simply a reminder, you know, kind of moral of the story that yes, in fact, you are your brother's keeper, not only because you're older need to kind of supervise him, but like kind of metaphorically, we are all our brother's keeper. We should, you know, look out for each other as a community, as a society which unfortunately we don't often do. So uh, what happens to Cain is that uh, he becomes exiled, right? He becomes a restless wanderer on the earth. Um, and this is one of many points, sort of offshoots that perhaps justifies the offshoot of, as we'll learn, of Ham, um, who's also exiled, cursed later, one of Noah's three sons. Um, so moving on to 
the end here. Um, this is the end of this section of reading. Uh, so coming to the end of this video lecture, um, it says here that Adam again knew his wife and she bore a son and called him Seth as to say, God has granted me other seed in place of Abel for Cain has killed him. As for Seth, to him too, a son was born and he called his name Enosh. It was then that the name of the Lord was first invoked. So, you know, the genealogical line goes Adam, Eve, then Adam and Eve produce Cain, then Abel, Abel is killed, then Adam and Eve produce Seth. And then Seth produces Enosh over here. But my question to you, and perhaps this is rhetorical, but it's something you need to think about is, who is Seth's wife to produce Enosh? It doesn't say, uh, that is the Bible does not at all mention a wife for Seth. Um, so on the one hand, you could say, well, women were so unimportant that, you know, she's not mentioned, or you could say that he had to have had sex with the only woman alive, which was E, which would have been his mother. Um, that's, you know, maybe not a uh, satisfying answer, but it is something that still, we just have to say, hmm, that's, that's a curious bit of omission there. Okay, that comes to the end of the text for today. So let me go back to the syllabus here. Um, this will be, uh, when I upload it, uh, the Hebrew Bible part one video, uh, which will be in the module one of Canvas that you can go back and uh, you know reread the text, rewatch the video as necessary, uh, and then take the quiz. And if you get answers wrong, you can go back and take the quiz again up until uh, midnight on August 23rd, this coming Monday. So uh, there you go, folks. If you have any specific questions for me, uh, please uh, inbox me in Canvas and uh, hope you all are doing well. And as you can see, this is you know gonna be, a, I hope a pretty streamlined course for you. Uh, you can do from the comfort of your fuzzy slippers at home. All right, folks, take care and uh, talk to you later.